I'm Elijah Henderson. Today we are located in Burns, Tennessee in an area that is part of the backside of one of their state parks. And this area is known as Werewolf Springs. If you take a look behind me, you can actually see the springs in the distance. But for the people who live in this town, this little area has had a notorious history behind it. Werewolf, Lugaroo, Dogman, Wolfman, Skinwalker, Labombre. No matter the name and no matter the culture that it is derived from, the name means the same thing. Terror. Since almost the dawn of times, there have been tales, rumors, reports, and stories of were-creatures. Sightings of man-wolf hybrids date back as far back as 500 BC when the Greek physician Theseus wrote of dog-headed men living in India. Some accounts of werewolves date them as far back as 2000 BC and were intimated and mentioned in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest written story in human history. Whatever you choose to call them, there's been lore and legends, myths and stories by the tens of thousands, and eyewitness accounts throughout history. Yes, friends, the belief in werewolves and other werebeasts are global in their scope, when one thinks of werewolves, you may think of Romania or medieval Europe, but you need not travel halfway around the globe to search of werewolf legends or sightings, because sometimes you may find that the lupine monster is much closer than you think. Accounts of one such beast takes us to a small town in Dixon County, Tennessee, and that small community is Burns, Tennessee. Burns, Tennessee has been home to stories of werewolves for decades, no strike that Burns has had purported werewolf activity for more than a century. This region, in my humble opinion, houses one of the more intriguing legends in the entire state of Tennessee. Before I get started, I feel an incumbent upon myself to make a small disclaimer and say that this video could almost be the littermate, please excuse the pun, of our recent video report on the White Bluff Screamer, which allegedly stalks the town of White Bluff, which is a scant seven or eight miles from Werewolf Springs. So if you haven't seen that video, I would highly recommend you watch that as well, perhaps even before this one. The legends surrounding Werewolf Springs date all the way back to the 1800s, and strange and anomalous things are still reported in the area to this very day. When you think of werewolves in America, more likely than not, you will think of the Beast of Bray Road, the Michigan Dogman, or possibly the Beast of Land Between the Lakes. But unfortunately, precious few people are familiar with the story of Werewolf Springs. Sightings of the Dixon County Werewolf date back to some time between the 1850s and early 1870s and coincide with an event that allegedly took place involving a train from the Cornhog Circus which was traveling through the area which today is known as the McNair Cut. It is told, according to local tradition, that the train derailed and crashed, allowing many of the traveling amusement animals to escape captivity and flee into the wild. However, the company managed to recapture every animal that had escaped incarceration on the train, except for two creatures that were listed on the manifest under the description of a wild man or a wolf man of Borneo, a supposedly half-man, half-wolf amalgamation. And as hard as they looked, they were never able to recapture these mysterious beasts. Legend says that the wild men, or wolfmen of Borneo, were large, strong, and very difficult to keep under control, and so they were kept in cages. Interestingly, at the time, there was a circus attraction, which was also called the Wild Men of Borneo, and those wild men would later join P.T. Barnum and his circus attractions. Those wild men were two dwarfish men with exceptional strength, that according to their fictional backstory, were captured in Borneo by armed sailors. However, when referencing the wild men or wolfmen of Borneo from the derailment legend, it has always been described as half man, half animal, and it is also said that it was so strong and dangerous that those who approached too closely to the exhibit could be seriously injured. Some renditions of this legend say that the train was damaged in some way and shut down due to mechanical failure, but most iterations of the story maintain that it was due to the railroad track itself being damaged and possibly sabotaged, and that was the chief cause of the derailment. It isn't too far-fetched to say that the track could have failed because of overuse. During the 1800s, railroads were constantly in use, and if the event took place prior to the Civil War in 1865, 
then railroads were constantly being used due to a high demand for shipping materials. Railroad tracks were difficult to upkeep because they were the primary form of travel. They stretched out for miles and miles and as a result became very hard to maintain. It has even been rumored that Union soldiers were vandalizing railroads in the South to disrupt shipping. This event, the train crash, took place only a rock's throw as the crow flies from Werewolf Springs along the railway that runs parallel to the edges of the state park that make up the front portion of Werewolf Springs. This derailment, however, proved to be just the start of many troubles for the residents of Burns, Tennessee, because just a few months later, a wealthy landowner and his farmhand who were coming home from a neighboring town where they had ventured to pick up either a special door or window that the landowner had purchased were riding on a wagon through the area that is currently State Route 47 from Burns to White Bluff. And as these two men were winding their way down those desolate and dark roadways, they began to be pursued and stalked by a large man-like creature which had a certain similitude to a man but more closely resembled a beast, and not just any beast. This monstrosity was more wolfish in nature. The landowner, whose gaze fell upon the half-cast monstrosity, began to speed past and tried to make an expeditious escape, but the nightmarish abomination began to pursue them faster to the point that they could no longer outrun it, and eventually it was able to lay hold of the back of their wagon and pull itself aboard. Seeing the close proximity of the creature to themselves and feeling that they were in mortal danger, the unfortunate duo decided to abandon the wagon and run in opposite directions, giving at least one of them a greater chance of escape and survival. The landowner and farmhand diverged pathways, each man fleeing and running as fast as they could away from the horrific aberration that was chasing after them. The landowner managed to shelter and hide behind a fallen tree until morning. With the rising of the sun, he realized that he had been fortunate enough to evade the beast. However, his hired hand had not been quite as lucky, because during those long hours of darkness, he heard the terrified cries of his farmhand that had been caught and was being savaged and torn apart. The man's body was never found and was presumably devoured, and the bestial thing that had given them chase was never identified. The Beast of Werewolf Springs is one of those unique cases where a dogman or Sasquatch-like creature is actually said to have killed someone. For those who are familiar with the beast of land between the lakes, it is probably known that it has been alleged to have killed humans on numerous occasions and individuals who were unfortunate enough to cross paths with it. No one knows for certain what that beast is, and neither do they know for sure what the beast of Werewolf Springs is. But throughout the entirety of the legend, it has been consistently described as looking just like a werewolf. Although I have no doubt that there is Sasquatch in the park because we have actually found Sasquatch footprints, recorded audio, and even spotted them on at least one occasion. Even renowned Bigfoot researcher Mary Green knew that there were Bigfoots in that location, which she stated to us were of the violent kind. However, even though we are certain of a Sasquatch presence there, we believe the primary occupant of that area is a dogman or a werewolf. In fact, the belief and description of a werewolf in that area is so prolific that some even say at night, sometimes you can see a werewolf walking across the cemetery that is butted up against the backside of Werewolf Springs. Briefly touching on the Sasquatch in that area, for those who visit the park, occasionally you will hear whoops and hollers far off in the distant hills, tree knocks and things stomping around in the brush. We've researched this area since at least 2001 or 2002 and found many an unusual thing. One of those items being a number of turtle shells found in Werewolf Springs that had large, flat, and human-like tooth prints gnawed into the edges of the shell as if something had tried to remove every sliver of meat off of the turtle. Now I understand that squirrels can perform a similar act with these turtle shells and have a similar appearance to flat, human-like teeth, but these shells in particular are unlike anything that could be attributed to damage caused by a squirrel or some other native fauna given the fact that the teeth marks are much larger and wider than a squirrel's. There's little doubt in my mind that there are indeed Sasquatch in the park, and I assume that they would endeavor to give these dog mannish creatures a very wide berth to avoid conflict with these vicious creatures. From some of the more recent research we've conducted, 
it almost seems that the Sasquatch have actually moved to a different region of the park and have largely traveled further away from Werewolf Springs. Perhaps they are attempting to segregate themselves away from any dogmen in the area given their aggressive behavior. We'll be doing a video on Sasquatch in the region very soon, but for today, I want to stay on topic and get back to focusing on the wolfish beast of Werewolf Springs. Following the event in the late 1800s that led to the death of the landowner's farmhand, groups of regional farmers and landowners from nearby decided to band together and hunt down and kill whatever it was that killed the unfortunate farmhand. If local lore is to be believed, and I see no reason in my studies to think it shouldn't be, the story says that the fellowship of farmers and local men gathered together at Hall Springs with the intent to lure the creature into a trap and kill it. The men brought a goat and set the poor animal in the middle of a clearing to bait the bloodthirsty beast that had recently slain one of theirs, in the hopes that they might slay it in return whilst it was distracted eating the goat. Soon enough, the trap was sprung when a terrifying creature walked into the clearing and they immediately opened fire on the mysterious creature. After the smoke cleared, they lit up their lanterns and checked the area to see if they had been successful. However, they were disturbed to learn that whatever it was had escaped, taking with it the goat as well as two of their men. It seems hard to believe that two men and a goat could be spirited away by one creature, but maybe it wasn't one beast. Maybe it was two, since a male and female creature escaped from the circus train. Not to mention the fact that dogmen are said to hunt in packs, and actually tend to flank their prey, and seem to be impervious to most gunshots. This experience was too much for the terrified group, as they left and never again attempted to hunt down the beast of Werewolf Springs. However, this wouldn't be the last time that someone would attempt to hunt down the monster, because sometime later, a big game hunter took it upon himself to slay the beast, and free the locals its murderous endeavors that were beginning to stack quite a body count. The hunter gathered his effects and anything that he supposed that he would need to put an end to this monster and headed to a private cabin in the middle of the forest. He stayed in the cabin for three days. The first two days, there was nothing unusual to report, but during the third night, he experienced a terror that he would surely have never forgotten throughout the remainder of his days. Sometime during the third night, he began to hear terrible howls emanating from the woods that seemed to be drawing nearer and nearer to his location. A short time later, he saw a dark silhouette positioned in the distance from his cabin window. The hunter fired a shot at the beast, provoking the creature into a horrible state of anger. For the hunter, the next moments had to have been some of the most terrifying of his entire life because the werewolfish beast commenced to breaking down the cabin door to gain entrance into the cabin. As the fearsome beast scrabbled and sought entrance inside, the hunter managed to climb up into the rafters of the cabin. The hunter shot at the monster with everything that he had in his arsenal, but no matter what he did, or how many rounds he fired at point-blank range, nothing seemed to damage this beast that was standing only a short distance below him, clawing and swiping at his feet, desperately trying to pull the man from his lofty perch. With every shot, the man became increasingly fearful and concerned that he wouldn't survive the night, because whatever this thing was, it seemed to be impervious to bullets. So just in case he wasn't able to put it down, the man was saving at least one bullet for himself. Even though the attack seemed to last a lifetime, the terrifying encounter only lasted for a short time, because the sun began to rise in the distance, and for whatever reason, the forest devil that had plagued him halted its attack and slipped outside into the light of morning and evaporated back into the wooded landscape. The Beast of Werewolf Springs has historically always been a very aggressive cryptid and is connected to numerous deaths and disappearances, including that of a young girl who wandered too close to a cave where the beast was rumored to live. This cave is said to have been located alongside Creech Lake and has since that time become flooded beneath the lake. Before flooding, however, the cave is said to have housed numerous animal and even human bones. Another account that we became aware of took place in Burns, Tennessee in 1973, and it goes a little something like this. In Burns, Tennessee in 1973, a young boy and a girl told their parents that they had witnessed a doggish, man-like thing enter their yard. They claimed that they were playing in the yard, 
and they seen what appeared to be a large creature walking out of the forest close by. They said it was quite large and dog-like. It had very little hair to speak of, and was very gaunt and spindly. It came out of the woods bearing long and skinny legs that looked unusual for any species of dog. It walked on all fours as it advanced toward the compost pile on their property, where it began to dig through the refuse for leftover food. The children kept watching, and after a moment, the dogman-type creature stood upright on two legs and used its two front arms to dig through the compost. The children described that instead of two paws like a regular dog, it had human-like hands, complete with fingers, which is common in eyewitness descriptions of dogmen. It used these hands to reach into the pile and draw the trash up to its muzzle, where it briefly sniffed the fragments and ate them in the same manner a person would. The children began to quietly speak one to another about whatever this thing was that was standing before them. They soon noticed that it was in the company of these children, where it stared at them for a few moments, seemingly analyzing them. This was the moment that they said was truly frightening for them. The children then reported that the beast, which was still standing upright on two legs, turned away toward the forest and ran away on its two back legs into the wood line and out of sight. One distinct detail that alarmed and disturbed the children was that it ran away swinging its arms in the same fashion that a human runs so that they can keep proper balance. This region has always been lush with sightings of mysterious upright hominoids and things of a paranormal nature. And Burns, Tennessee just so happens to be the location of my very first experience with the cryptid. Ever since I first began visiting the state park on the front side of the springs, I've been regaled with stories of sasquatches and werewolfish beasts that wander throughout the park and call it home. Even park rangers and officials have shared the story of the werewolf through a documentary that they used to show in the park called The Legend of Werewolf Springs. They had two miniature documentaries that they would play from time to time for visitors of the park, but unfortunately, I've never been able to find a copy of either one of the videos. I have friends who had the video, but sadly they lost their copies. The documentary detailed the history of that section of the park that was originally known as Hall Springs until the time when the werewolf began to be seen around the area, and it was then nicknamed Werewolf Springs. The springs in the park refer to a spot where clear, fresh water bubbles up from an underground water table. Despite housing some sort of lycanthropic beastie, there is still beautiful scenery all along these rustic backwood trails. When putting together a new nightmare nugget, I generally don't like to mention odd sightings and events that we have been a part of ourselves, because we don't want to make it sound like every time we investigate an area, we have interesting and almost fantastical encounters happen to us. We generally make mention of historical accounts or stories that have been relayed to us personally. However, due to the fact that Werewolf Springs was the site of my very first encounter for something of the cryptid variety, I'll take a moment to speak on it. This particular event happened in either 2001 or 2002, placing me at either the very young age of 5 or 6. My family and I had been camping in the front side of the park when park officials decided to have a park showing of the legend of werewolf springs. My dad, Johnny Henderson, having been a huge fan of werewolves all of his life, heard about the upcoming showing which left no possible outcome except that we would be there for the special showing. He had briefly heard about the werewolf up in Burns, Tennessee from fellow construction workers while working on a construction site in Dixon County near White Bluff. So when he heard that the park would be showing the tape, he wanted to view it. I have to say that the video was awesome and it focused on most of the strange occurrences that we have already mentioned, and it left those of us who had watched it with a burning interest in the story. What could this foul beast that was stalking the dense forest of the park possibly be? Our first thought was Bigfoot. It wouldn't be very long until we would try to investigate the legend for ourselves, because in the following weeks, we made a trip to Werewolf Springs, and this trip would forever change how we felt about the woods and the things that roamed therein. We managed to find Werewolf Springs and decided to take a lengthy stroll through the whole area and it was a somewhat quiet day. Nothing was really stirring around and there even seemed to be a creepy, almost ominous feeling looming around. From where we parked the car, we walked about halfway to the actual springs and for whatever reason we decided to step off of the trail and explore a large gap in the grass where it appeared something large had stepped off onto the path. We weren't alone in the park that day, 
because just a short time earlier, we had seen two women walking along the trail, and there was a Boy Scout troop camping in a park provided lean-to that was located further down the trail near the actual springs. The foliage was fairly dense where we had decided to step off the pathway and hike. It was brushy and somewhat overgrown, but we decided to keep walking for a ways. We walked a short distance further into the bushes, and we found where a small pine tree had been broken off at about my current chest height. The broken tree top still dangled from the lower half of the tree. For those who may not be aware, the breaking trees and branches is a Bigfoot trait and is speculated to be some form of a primitive trail marker. Continuing on, the path eventually opened up a little bit more and gave us a little bit more walking room. I suppose this event had to have taken place sometime in the late fall or very early spring because it was not quite cold that day, but it was definitely airish. About 50 to 75 feet from the point where the path opened up a little, we came upon a pile of turkey feathers. But the unusual thing about these feathers was that it wasn't quite a pile of feathers. It looked more like a half circle made up of feathers, almost like something had been squatting there plucking out feathers and laying them around itself in a semicircle. A few minutes following this odd find, one of the ladies in our group stepped away to answer the call of nature and relieve their bladder. And just a few moments after she finished her business and returned to the group, the wind began to pick up significantly and large trees started to sway back and forth, and the sky began to grow darker as if a storm was moving into the area. The next few moments forever changed our outlook on the natural world, because for us, the following minutes were like something straight out of a horror movie. I mentioned earlier the railroad that runs alongside the park, and is said to be the catalyst and origins of this wolfish beast that is said to inhabit the park. Well, to this day, those railroad tracks are still in use, and trains still use them frequently. And at this particular moment, as we were standing by ourselves in the forest, and off of the main pathway, a train came through the area and sounded its whistle. The train's horn echoed all across the forest, and was audible for a great distance. At the moment when the train began sounding its horn, something else responded. Alongside this loud horn was a horrible, guttural, painfully terrifying, almost mournful howl that began to permeate the very air all around us. I'll never be able to fully put into words exactly just how loud this thing was that was howling. The closest description we've ever been able to give to the beast was that it sounded like an 800 or 1,000 pound wolf. The horrible cry of this werewolf was so powerful that the sound shook and rattled in your chest in the same way that a powerful speaker at a concert or a theater can do. The volume of the howl was of such magnitude that as loud as it was, you could tell that it came from somewhere in the distance and wasn't emanating from right next to you. The awful nature of the howl almost could make one think that the beast recognized and remembered the sound of the ancient enemy that once held it captive so many years ago. The howl was ear-splitting and terrifying that you could almost imagine in your mind's eye this gigantic beast with its arms thrown wide apart, head reared back, roaring its inhuman rage into the sky. It was a fearful experience, to say the least. One of the terrified ladies in our group began to panic and ran in the opposite direction. My dad, however, grabbed her by the arm and told her not to run off because if it was an animal, it might sense her fear and attack. So we all stood there for the next few minutes, listening to this creature howling in pain at the train whistle that pierced its ears. And for a child of five or six years old like I was, who was hearing the howl of a werewolfish type monster, it felt like an eternity to stand there, knowing that it was close by was a horrible experience. In just a few moments following this terrifying event, we made our way back to the trail with a quickness in our feet. We didn't linger around. Finally reaching the trail, we briefly saw the women who were walking the trail earlier. They now were running out of the park as if they were running for their lives. They were terrified because they too had heard the same unearthly howls that had wailed in the distance, or so they told my grandmother when she stopped them to ask if they'd heard anything. Following that very unique day at Werewolf Springs, and because of it, we would make numerous trips with numerous people to investigate the park over the years. And it was this very event that gave birth to our interest in Bigfoot field research and cryptozoology. We had always had an interest in cryptids, but never actually pursued them. I have to confess that being at the tender young age of either five or six, 
It was a long time before I would comfortably enter the woods again, and you were absolutely crazy if you thought that I would go back to that side of the park willingly. I would even go so far as to sit in the car and wait for everyone to finish hiking. There were a few rare, and I mean rare, times that I would go there and hike, but only if my dad were there. But more often than not, I would avoid Werewolf Springs altogether. The peculiar thing, though, is that after hearing those horrible howlings, I became very interested in the subject of Sasquatch and was consistently renting books on Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Yeti at the local library, despite being terrified by the apish beast. After the encounter, we became members of a Bigfoot organization that conducted most of their research in the mountains of East Tennessee. It was in this group that we met fellow researcher and friend Nathan Davis and the wonderful Mary Green who we talked with and was even given hair samples that had been analyzed at a laboratory and came back as undocumented primate. Ever since that day we heard those howls, we had always maintained that it was a Sasquatch that we heard howling in the woods, mainly because we had never heard of a dogman, and we thought that people were just misidentifying the creature there in the park. But ever since becoming aware of the dogman phenomenon in recent years, we've had to reevaluate and rethink everything and even shine a new investigative light on everything we knew about the legend and go back and look at old evidence that we had found, including excessively large canine footprints that we had discounted because we believed that we were searching for a Sasquatch. And that should teach us a lesson about having preconceived ideas. Over the years, we have learned that you have to follow the evidence and not just your opinion. Sure, we maintain that there are, without a doubt, Sasquatch in the park, but almost every piece of history regarding the story, the eyewitness accounts, the history of murders and violent aggression and modern encounters, footprints, vocalizations, and etc., leads one to believe that the beast of Werewolf Springs is not a Sasquatch at all, but rather a dogman. To date, there has been no update of the history that describes the creature as looking anything like a Sasquatch, it has always been described as appearing like a man-wolf hybrid. About a year or so after our experience at Werewolf Springs, we moved to our current home in Clarksville, Tennessee, and we continue to investigate the area any chance we get. We hope to continue our research of the springs in the coming year once it has time to warm up a little bit. Like I said earlier, the legend of Werewolf Springs is still largely unheard of, and you can find very little about it online. In this video, we have detailed almost every story, legend, and historical event that we are aware of. Unfortunately, though, you have to be careful as you look into online accounts about this story, because occasionally I'll find stories that have great embellishments added to them, as though someone was trying to make a creepypasta story from the legend. For anyone who decides to take it upon themselves to investigate the springs, do be careful, not just because of the werewolf or even the White Bluff Screamer, which has also been allegedly sighted roaming through the area. The springs are also home to coyotes, venomous snakes such as water moccasins, which absolutely have chased us through the park. There are numerous spots where the ground is uneven if you're going through there at night, and I'm sure that there are bobcats and cougars, despite what park officials may tell you. There are many other things to worry about than a cryptid, and if you're ever down there, walking through the quiet, desolate woods on your own, and you hear the quietness, pierced by the approaching train whistle, begin to echo across the forest. Listen closely, because you may just hear the mournful cry of the beast of Werewolf Springs. Once again, I'm Elijah Henderson from Cryptid Studies Institute, or Cryptid SI for short, and I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Nightmare Nuggets of Cryptid Terror. And if you like these true accounts in miniature episode form, then please take a moment to subscribe to our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channel, Cryptid Studies Institute. It really helps us out. And make sure to click that little bell icon in the bottom right hand side to be notified of when we post a new video and even share these videos. We upload videos every week, barring some disaster, so keep checking in for new and interesting content. And as I just said, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you'd like to be a guest on our soon-to-launch radio show, we'd love to have you. We'll have details regarding that online very soon. And if you've had an encounter with some kind of cryptid, like the Beast of Werewolf Springs, or the White Bluff Screamer, 
a Sasquatch, or even a supernatural experience, and you'd like to tell us about it, we'd love to hear it. If you'd like for us to read your account for you, then please drop us a line and we'll make that happen. If you have any questions or inquiries regarding cryptids, send us a message or comment down below, and we'll do our best to help you out. See you next time.